here today with my friend Sabine. Sabine has been a really special part of our church family here at KZMC for about 10 years now. Yeah. It's been about 10 years. Yeah. And Sabine has a really unique story and it's about her journey with schizophrenia. And so we're gonna have Sabine just share what that journey has, has looked like. And I have here with me a, a book that Sabine has written. It's called A Life Worth Living, My Unforgettable Journey with Schizophrenia. And I know it's been a tremendous blessing for myself hearing Sabine share about what that experience is like and how God's been really present and has carried her through these years. So we're going to have a conversation here, the two of us, and we invite you to join in. And we trust that this will be a, a helpful time for you as well. May, uh, may God bless you. May he direct our conversation as well as we share together. So as we begin, Sabine, could you just begin by telling us a little bit more about yourself? Who are you? What does life look like? What are the things that you enjoy doing? My name is Sabine. I'm 51 years old, and I was born in Germany. I grew up there with my two older brothers, and I came to Canada when I was 25. And um, I like to, to read a lot. I like to write. I like to spend time with friends. I like to walk and swim and bike. And I like to spend time with God. And uh, Raymond, my husband and I, we used to have a dog. Nick was his name. But he passed away four years ago. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you don't spend too much time sitting still. You're very active. I like to be active, yeah. yeah. Right on. Yeah. I think as, as a first step in our conversation, could you share a little bit about what life looked like for you prior to discovering your illness? Prior to my illness, I was um, a very happy little girl. I spent a lot of time with my friends. I spent a lot of time in nature. Nature was very, very important to me right from the start. And also was very important to me was God. Right since I can remember, God played a crucial role in my life. I, I liked to explore a lot when I was a child. We went into the woods and we would climb up trees and it was just so nice to discover the world because the world had so much to offer to me when I was a child. And then I started doing sports a lot. I did uh, downhill skiing races and track and field and swimming competitions. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed to win. And if I didn't win, then I would be very, very hard on myself and telling me how dare you not to win. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of things changing for me. Okay. Okay. So you're well, why don't you continue on with that? Can you share a little bit more about how you discovered that, that uh, things weren't quite the way they should have been? What I noticed was that when I was 14 years old, that I changed. My marks at school got worse because I, I couldn't concentrate anymore to get ready for exams. And also, I was very, very... strict with myself, I would say. If I didn't win, that was just, uh, the world would almost come to an end for me, right? And, and I was just uh, almost raping my body by having to get better, having to get stronger, no breaks in between practices, no breaks between races. I just got to a point where my body told me very clearly, you know what, this is it for me, I'm not doing this anymore. And it, can you share a little bit about how your body told you that and how you discovered that you couldn't continue with that pace? I just started to be in pain, physical pain, but even more emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I was very brutal with myself. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed the, the decline in my abilities to okay. succeed. Yeah in sports and as I said, especially at school, I struggled more and more. Yeah. And what I noticed too was that I was very extreme. I, I was very, very happy and spent a lot of time with my friends and doing sports, was out all the time, or I wanted to be alone, locked up in my bedroom and just reading or writing or, or crying or, or just wanting to die. Yeah. That was 
the first real eye opener for me that okay. something changed. I was 15 when I okay. tried to end my life. Okay, yeah. And so in 1988, you received a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about, about that? Yeah, so the first diagnosis was psychosis, which means okay. losing touch with reality. And boy, did I ever do that. Mm -hmm. I really did lose touch with reality. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that the year 1988 started rocky for me because I lost the three people uh, within weeks mm -hmm. who meant the most to me. Okay. Yeah, so and then from then on, er everything went just downhill even more. I, I still dragged myself out of bed in the morning. I still went to school, but my marks continued to get worse. And then I can remember in May of 1988, I didn't sleep for an entire week. I was just too happy to sleep and too excited, too busy. I would be singing and dancing and, you know, just being active all the time, writing lots and lots of letters to dear friends, knitting and doing other crafts and just being so pumped and so hyper. I just couldn't sleep for an entire week. Wow. But then my body crashed and burned, right? After that, I was in bed for three weeks straight <clears throat> and I experienced depression, the deepest depression of my life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to die so badly and my body was so heavy mm -hmm. and I couldn't go to school. I couldn't function anymore. Okay. Yeah. And so from that point, what were the steps in terms of dis uh, receiving that diagnosis? Well, it happened right when they brought me into the hospital, which was in July of 1988. The doctor just told me, you know, you're very sick, you have a psychosis, and you have to start taking medication. Okay. And I did that, and I had to take medication three times a day. And it was really hard for me. And the reason why is because when we were growing up, we didn't have any headache pills or anything in okay. our home. Everything was just uh, remedies, natural remedies from our grandmother that my mom always used. Mm -hmm. So having to take 10 pills every day from one day to another was just really hard for me. But the strange thing is that right from the beginning, with a little bit of sane thoughts in my mind, I knew if I don't take these medications, then the chances for me to survive are zero. Mm. So that is what helped me a lot, yeah. just to realize either you live mm. taking a medication or you don't take the medication and you die. Yeah. That was the option. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so thankful, Sabine. I'm really happy that mm -hmm. that intervention happened at that time with the doctor to, to help care for you and provide for you yeah. in that way. So then for, for life from that point on, what did the next number of years look like? Once, once you were taking the medication, a little bit more stable, what, what, did life, what did it look like the next number of years? Life was a challenge for me, mm -hmm. but I needed to, to keep going, and I knew that. Mm -hmm. So after I came back from the hospital, which was in the November of 1988, I started working in my grandfather's pen factory, okay. and I worked there for a few months, and that was really good for me. I was allowed to drive the the company van, which was a, a big van for nine people it was, and I was driving all over the place, and, and it gave me some sense of freedom. I, I felt a little bit under control because my mind was just going all over the place, but being in that van and driving just gave me some control over, okay. over my life, and yeah. that was a a really important step to my next goal, which was going back to high school. And going back to high school was um, very, very good for me because my mind was constantly busy with <clears throat> studying for the next exam. 
instead of sitting at home and, and feeling sorry for myself. So being able to go back to high school and graduating from high school was very, very important to me for my own self-esteem because my self-esteem was just sure. absolutely yeah. in the yeah. ground, right? There was no self-esteem left after yeah. I, I got sick. So mm -hmm. that was a, a really wonderful experience for me. Yeah. And it gave me the courage to apply to a school which was in the Black Forest back home in Germany. Okay. It's a beautiful area. Okay. You would like it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that again, uh, graduating from that language school, just gave me the strength and the courage to, to get to my next goal, which was coming to Canada. And, and I just wanted to tell you how this started. Yeah. I, I was 12 years old and I had a, a new desk for my bedroom and I wanted to protect that desk. So I, I bought a, just, it, it was about this big and it was made out of plastic and it had the, the world on it, a, a picture of the world. And I was sitting there one day and I tried to find little Germany somewhere buried within Europe. And then I just looked around and I saw on the top left corner, there was this huge country. And I thought, man, what is this? Oh, Canada, oh, Canada. It's so big, it's so beautiful. And then it was as if lightning struck me and I said to myself, when I grow up, I'm going to live in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I was 12 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating how God directs our paths. Yeah. Eh? So what were the mm -hmm. steps? What were the mm -hmm. steps then in terms of how you arrived to Canada? Well, the first step was God's voice in the psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. When I was 19, I remember one night, all I wanted to do was just die because the depression and the fear and the just everything that was going on in my mind wanted me to stop living but god said that night to me sabine if you ever want to be healthy again and live a good life then you have to live in canada okay yeah and here you are living <laughs> on the shore of lake huron yeah enjoying the sunsets and the water yeah yeah. With Raymond and with wonderful, Raymond and yeah. So how did you, how did you first begin seeing how and when, did you first begin seeing the signs of schizophrenia? So, the biggest sign was and is the voices that I'm okay. hearing. Mm -hmm. Yes, for me that was it, the voices. Yeah. Yeah. And what age did you first hear those voices? That was when I was in a psychiatric hospital in okay. the fall of 1988. From okay. one day to the other, they were just there. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you tell us, uh, is there anything else you want to want to say that will help us to understand what experiencing schizophrenia is like? It's just a, a roller coaster ride of emotions and mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. One second, you were somewhere with your thoughts and the next second you're completely different direction and you're just going like man what what's going on mm -hmm. what am i thinking what am i feeling like you completely are disconnected with yourself okay you constantly try to make sense of what's going on around you but because you're hearing voices in my case like some schizophrenics they see things they feel things, they taste things, they smell things. So all the senses can be there, can be, can be there. But it's just, for me personally, with the voices, this is um, a 24 seven, right? Mm -hmm. Like even at nighttime, I would have all these nightmares. So, and then in the morning waking up, just that simple act of getting up was hard mm -hmm. because the voices told me that I should just stay in bed and, and sleep all day instead of getting up and going to work. Right, yeah, that would be exhausting. Yeah. Now, you shared with me that in 1996, you met with a particular uh, psychiatrist yeah. who was really caring and had yeah. excellent uh, insight. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that person and how they helped to guide you? Yeah, he cared for me by telling me the truth. 
he actually was the one who gave me the diagnosis schizophrenia. Okay. And he just cared for me for 22 and a half years. Our relationship was very, very strong and very, very good. And then unfortunately on April the 7th, 19, so 2019, he suddenly passed away mm -hmm. with a heart attack. Yeah. yeah. But he was guiding me through all these years mm -hmm. and he, he believed in me. And I think this is what was the most crucial part about our relationship, yeah. that he always believed in me. He both believed in you and spoke the truth. Yes. Yeah, but cheer, cheered you on then from that. He cheered me on. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So another point of thankfulness. Yeah. Thank you so much to God that he provided this person in your life. That's at right. That time. So, so always at the right time, the right people came into my life. And when God knew now she's almost really at the end of her strength, then he would send me somebody who gives me the hope to continue with life. Mm -hmm. And my psychiatrist was one of those people. Yeah. And it was so funny. We had a, a little game. <laughs> so the, the interns, the medical students who were considering becoming psychiatrists, they could sit in our session. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Harishan and I, we would talk to each other. He's my psychiatrist. And then they were supposed to guess what illness I have. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we would talk. <laughs> And then we asked him, so what do you think, what illness does Sabine have? And then it's just, they looked at the psychiatrist, then they looked at me, then they looked at the psychiatrist, <laughs> then they looked at me. She doesn't have an illness, <laughs> you know. And, and the psychiatrist and I, we were just laughing our heads sure. off. We, we yeah. were just, like, yeah. we were like little kids playing. Yeah. And, and this game was just so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've, you've shared about just how significant your faith has been mm -hmm. and the presence and the voice of God mm -hmm. along the way in yeah. terms of sustaining you. Um, anyway, I, I won't say more. Yeah. Share with us about what that yeah. has been like. So that is the reason, Ryan, why I am here today, God. Without God, I would not have had the strength the ability, the motivation to keep living. And God was the one who was always this much faster than the evil voices that I'm hearing. So if the voices tell me that I have to run into the oncoming truck, then God says, no, Sabine, you just stand there, you wait until the truck passes, and then you cross the road. Mm -hmm. So God, for some reason, and I'm so thankful for that, mm -hmm. has always been there to, pro, to prevent me from killing because that is what the voices want me to do. Mm -hmm. That's their favorite topic, death. And in gory detail, they tell me every day how I should kill other people or myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But God has been there, yeah. has been present, and has yeah. spoken words of truth and life yeah. over you. Over me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks yeah. be to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be your, well, sorry, before I proceed to the next question, is there anything else you want to express along those lines mm -hmm. of how your faith has carried you? It's just marvelous mm -hmm. because in the midst of, of the deepest depression and of your deepest fears, there is this light, mm -hmm. this warm light that radiates peace mm -hmm. and that peace comes to us if we let it happen. That's what God wants to do in all our lives. He wants us to be peaceful and that was something I noticed right away but I was so far away from peace, right? So I made it my biggest goal to spend more and more time with God to feel that peace that is coming from him. And when I stopped spending every waking hour with friends, which I had to do for so many years because of what was going on in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. But now, especially through COVID, and I think we all feel the same way, 
suddenly I had so many hours that I didn't have before. And that's the biggest opportunity because God likes to talk to us. And as you know, when we are silent so that we can hear his soft voice instead of listening to those screaming voices that were in my head too. So I had the choice every single day, just like the rest of us. Do I listen to this loud voice that tries to destroy me? Or do I listen to the gentle voice that tries to give me life? And I made it my goal ever since I started hearing these voices in the fall of 1988 to live. Yeah. And with God's help, I do live. I don't survive anymore. I don't exist anymore. Ryan, I live. Right. Yeah. Hence the title of your book, A Life, <laughs> yeah. a life Worth Living. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What would be your one central piece of advice? to someone who may be experiencing schizophrenia? To be honest okay. with yourself. If you notice that there is something different, your thoughts are not the same, your feelings are not the same, you, you spend less time with your friends, you, you want to be alone in your room all the time, you think about dying all the time, that's when it's time to look for help. And there's marvelous, wonderful help out there I've just had so many good psychiatrists and counselors in my life. There is help, so please get the help because things can get better. But you need to admit, I need help. Admit it, and then there is help. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Sabine. Yeah. And uh, so I'll just, for what it's worth, add my, add my echo to that of the invitation to seek to seek help. Uh, Sabine, when you describe the things that you experience on a daily basis, you know, it's hard for someone like myself to imagine because we experience you as such a bright, shining light in our community, a place of peace and a place of, of joy. And uh, so that's just, for me, really encouraging to hear you say that, that there is, life is, is a possibility. So thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. I always enjoy each conversation we have because I always learn something new about your story. Yeah. I didn't know that you uh, that you drove a, a van for your for your family. <laughs> I did. There was one other detail you, you shared that I, I had not heard before. Anyhow, it's a fascinating story. And so for those of you who've joined us for this conversation, I just want to highlight for you again, Sabine's book, A Life Worth Living. Uh, maybe you're personally experiencing schizophrenia, you want better insight, maybe someone you love is, or maybe just in general, it would be really helpful to have better insight into this and the power and the presence of God in the midst of it. So I, I can't recommend this book enough. Uh, message me. Check out our church website. You'll find my email address there. Message uh, myself or the church on our social media platforms and I'd be happy to mm -hmm. make arrangements to get this book in your hands as well. Sabine does do readings of her book in various, whether it's in your, in your church, in your school, your community group, or maybe it's just in your living room with some friends. Uh, Sabine shares her story more fully so again reach out let us know if you think that that would be would be helpful thanks so much for joining us thank you sabine for your story yeah and i'll give you the last word but just for myself to conclude uh in summary like just so much thanks to god as well that he's been present that he's sustained you and that he's brought you to this point and is blessing so many people through you by sharing this story so yeah thanks thank to god. you so much ryan for having me and, and I just wanted to say one thing being diagnosed with a mental illness is not a death sentence life can and will and must go on